Gaude amus omnes in domino. I am going the way of the fathers, for I see myself being summoned by the Lord. Welcome to The Way of the Fathers, a podcast sponsored by CatholicCulture.org. I'm your host, Mike Aquilina. This week, it's my pleasure to talk about Cyprian of Carthage. Cyprian lived slightly more than a decade as a Christian, and almost all of those years, he served as the bishop of one of the major cities in the Roman Empire. Kind of a big job for a neophyte. What's more, his episcopate coincided with a solid decade of crisis. The Church of Carthage suffered simultaneous persecution, pandemic, economic collapse, and catastrophic climate change. It fell to Cyprian, in spite of his inexperience, to shepherd his people through all of it. He succeeded to a remarkable degree, and in his few years as a Christian, he managed to set a model for pastoral leadership that would be invoked forever afterward. He regained star status, in fact, in the 21st century as the world faced a new plague and searched history for precedence. Well, Cyprian was born for high status, though of a very different kind. He was born to a wealthy family in Carthage, the great metropolis of Roman North Africa. The year of his birth probably fell between 200 and 210. His family was wealthy and he received an excellent classical education. He was a master of rhetoric, and he made a name for himself by practicing the art in courts of justice, in the public assembly, and in political debate. He was on friendly terms with the influence leaders in his society. He had success and money and a busy social life. He had everything an aristocratic pagan could want, but he was miserable. He described himself as, quote, lying in darkness and gloomy night, wavering here and there, tossed about on the foam of this boastful age, and uncertain of my wandering steps, knowing nothing of my real life. End of quote. At midlife, his misery began to feel unbearable. In a letter to a friend, he wrote in general terms of his enslavement to error and vice. He mentioned lust in passing and a fondness for wine, but his besetting crisis ran deeper. It was a crisis of meaning. He had remarkable skills and opportunities. He had pursued his ambitions and achieved his goals, but it all seemed pointless. The traditional Roman religion gave him no answers and no comfort. In fact, it only made matters worse. The gods of the Roman pantheon were themselves drunkards and lechers. They were violent in their jealousies, ruthless in their ambitions. After pondering the Roman myths, Cyprian wondered at their value. Quote, Can he who looks upon such things be healthy-minded or modest? Men imitate the gods whom they adore, and to such miserable beings their crimes become their religion. He described his life in terms that will be familiar to anyone who has experienced the power of addiction. He was, he said, held in chains by the innumerable errors of my life, from which I did not believe that I could possibly be delivered. So I was disposed to give in to my clinging vices. And because I despaired of better things, I used to indulge my sins as if they were actually part of me and innate to me. Cyprian identified himself with his vices, but he hated what the vices were doing to him. Yet he witnessed happiness in the lives of the Christians he knew. A priest named Cecilius befriended Cyprian and persuaded him that he could overcome vice with the help of divine grace. It was no mean feat to persuade the city of Carthage's master persuader, but Cecilius pulled it off. And he baptized Cyprian and received him into the church around the year 246. Cyprian pledged himself to lifelong celibacy and dedicated himself to the life of the church. 
He sold off his possessions and real estate and gave the money to the poor. The Christians of Carthage were astonished. Cyprian had been an A-list celebrity, his days filled with glory, his nights with lust and luxury. He had been living the Carthaginian dream and now had thrown it over for Christianity. Ordinary Christians welcomed him into their midst, and the bishop was impressed enough by Cyprian's progress that he ordained him to priesthood less than a year after his baptism. He proved himself a holy and gifted priest, so much so that a year later, when his bishop died, the people clamored for Cyprian to be named his successor. Not all of the clergy in Carthage were happy with the situation. Some actively opposed Cyprian. Perhaps they were envious of his talents and popularity. Perhaps they thought it was crazy to turn the entire church in Africa over to a man who had been Christian for only two years and could easily go backsliding into his old bad habits. But God's ways are not our ways. Cyprian the neophyte soon found himself Cyprian, the successor of the apostles. And then broke loose all the hell that the Roman Empire could muster. In January of the year 250, the Emperor Dacius issued an edict requiring everyone in the empire to offer sacrifice to the Roman gods. Each sacrifice would be witnessed by a magistrate, who would then register the act on a certificate. The certificate could be carried about and produced on demand, like proof that you had paid your taxes or got your car inspected. To Cyprian's sorrow, a great many Christians rushed to the temples to offer their sacrifice and avoid the penalties and harassment. Others were dragged to the altars unwillingly, but failed to withstand the work of the torturers. They caved under pressure and gave worship to the gods. Still others bought forged certificates on the black market so that they could avoid making sacrifice, but also avoid the consequences of breaking the law. The pagan mob seized the occasion to settle scores with their Christian neighbors. They denounced people publicly and dragged them forcibly before the magistrate. But there was one Christian the mob wanted more than any others. That was Cyprian. As leader of the church, he held a symbolic position in the community. By taking out Cyprian, the mob would decapitate and humiliate the church. They would also give comeuppance to a prominent man who was pagan till quite recently, and whose conversion they still felt as a stinging insult. As they cried for Cyprian's blood, they swept up any Christians who might stand in their way. Keen to protect his flock, Cyprian slipped out of the city and took refuge in a nearby hiding place. The priests who had opposed his ordination saw Cyprian's flight as an act of cowardice. But remaining in Carthage, he would have placed the lives of others in danger, and he would have been severely restricted in his ministry anyway. From his hiding place, however, he was able to accomplish much more, writing many letters to individuals and instructions to his clergy and his people. He received reports, reports of chaos within the church. Some Christians who had offered sacrifice immediately regretted their sin and sought readmission to the sacraments. Within the church, there were some who believed that such sinners should not be absolved until their deathbed. There were also clergy, however, who were willing to offer them easy reconciliation. So apostates started shopping around for the priests who would give them the best deal. And so, in the midst of persecution, the church became bitterly divided between rigorists and laxists. There were also reports of strange liturgical abuses in the churches. Some priests who were teetotalers were celebrating the Mass without the chalice of wine. That's not valid. Throughout his year of hiding, Cyprian managed these multiple crises by means of letters, and much of his literary legacy comes from this period. For example, his treatise on the reconciliation of lapsed Christians, produced during this time, is a very important text in the history of the sacrament of penance. In it, he charts the course that the wider church would adopt as its own, rejecting laxity on one side by demanding penance, but rejecting rigorism on the other side and clearing a way for sinners to come home. During this time, Cyprian also composed the earliest known document dedicated entirely to the Holy Eucharist. 
It is deeply biblical, drawing from both the Old and New Testaments, and it explicates the theology of sacrifice that is implicit in the gospel accounts and Christian practice. His correspondence also includes treatises and letters addressed to civil authorities in Carthage, men he had known well in his secular life. Now he was pleading with them to be reasonable and practice clemency as they judged Christians who wished them no harm. But in the city and the countryside, matters grew worse. A plague broke out in Africa, and soon it spread outward to the known world. Historians debate the viral cause of the pandemic in 250. It may have been a novel influenza virus or hemorrhagic fever. At its peak, the plague claimed thousands of lives every day in the densely populated cities. It quickly reduced the population of the known world by a third. The equivalent number of deaths today would be 2.5 billion worldwide. By this time, Cyprian was back in the city, having concluded that his presence there was necessary. The plague of the year 250 is one of the momentous events in Roman history. It weakened the empire, which was already suffering from barbarian incursions and even catastrophic climate change. The temperatures had been unusually low for several years running, and this had led to disappointing harvests and widespread famine. You'd think that these new crises would turn the authorities' attention away from the persecution of Christians, but they didn't. They only made matters worse. In fact, the Romans blamed the plague on the Christians' stubborn refusal to offer sacrifice. This, they said, is how the gods were taking their vengeance. Cyprian addressed those charges directly in his correspondence with the civil authorities. But argument wasn't Cyprian's only response to the plague. Everyone else might despair, but the Christians actually did something useful. The city of Carthage, you see, had no organized way of dealing with epidemics. There was no board of sanitation to clean up the open sewers or ask people to practice social distancing. There were no city employees tasked with burying the bodies that were piled up in the streets in the summer heat. In the face of a disastrous epidemic, the only response the establishment could think of was to try to propitiate the gods. Killing some Christians might make the gods happy, but taking care of the sick was out of the question. Christians reacted very differently. Cyprian exhorted his congregation, saying, There is nothing remarkable in cherishing merely our own people with the due attentions of love, but that one might become perfect. We should do something more than heathen men or publicans. We should overcome evil with good and practice a merciful kindness like that of God. We should love our enemies as well. Thus the good should be done to all men, not merely to the household of faith. So he was informing Christian doctors that they had a duty to treat not only their co-religionists, but also their pagan persecutors. They had a religious duty to serve even their neighbors who were most unneighborly. The Christian response was well organized. The church had already built up a system of institutional charity like nothing the pagan world had ever seen. Now, faced with an unprecedented emergency, the church put its social network into action to serve Christians and pagans alike. The modern medical historian William McNeil offers an interesting perspective on the effect of this Christian activism. He says, One advantage Christians had over their pagan contemporaries was that care of the sick, even in time of pestilence, was for them a recognized religious duty. When all normal services break down, quite elementary nursing will greatly reduce mortality. Simple provision of food and water, for instance, will allow persons who are temporarily too weak to cope for themselves to recover instead of perishing miserably. Moreover, those who survived with the help of such nursing were likely to feel gratitude and a warm sense of solidarity with those who had saved their lives. The effect of disastrous epidemic, therefore, was to strengthen Christian churches at a time when most other institutions were being discredited. Because of the church's singular efforts, the most extensive records we have of the plague of 250 are in the writings of Cyprian. As a result, historians remember it still today as the plague of Cyprian. 
It's one of the ironies of history that the Plague of 250 is probably the most prominent monument to Cyprian's memory. The more important monument, however, is the institution he helped to invent. It's an institution that doesn't bear Cyprian's name, but for which he deserves some credit, and that's the hospital. The organized relief efforts in Carthage were important precursors of modern medicine. Before the rise of Christianity, there was no institution that resembled the hospital. Only with the legalization of Christianity in the 4th century were hospitals permanently established. But when those first hospitals were built, they were built on foundations laid down in the preaching of Cyprian. It's possible that Christian charity in those times of extreme social stress won the church a reprieve. After his return to Carthage, Cyprian was able to exercise his leadership effectively for several more years. In a time of extraordinary pressure and division, he strove to bring about unity in the church. As one historian puts it, during the nine years of his episcopate, St. Cyprian, without constraining anyone, without any encroachment on the rights of his colleagues, by means of his personal influence and skill, was able to group around him the hundred or so bishops who governed the African churches. Cyprian helped his fellow bishops to see the advantages of collegial action. He helped his clergy to see the necessity of uniform discipline and penance. And he helped his congregations to see the light of the gospel and understand the demands of the gospel. As in his secular life, so in his ecclesial life. Cyprian was a diplomat capable of prodigies of persuasion. He was a leader who understood the value of regular and consistent communication. He was a man of decisive but organized action. A new emperor named Valerian donned the purple in 253, and at first he seemed uninterested in the Christian problem. The church's life was able to return to something like normal, and Christians were able to exhale and relax. But it didn't last long. In 257, Valerian launched a renewed program of forced sacrifice. Cyprian saw what was coming, and so he wrote an exhortation to martyrdom addressed to his people in order to prepare them for the ordeal. In August of 257, Cyprian himself was arrested and banished to a city some 60 miles away. A year later, he was recalled to house arrest in Carthage, and there he was publicly beheaded on September 14, 258. Cyprian's life as a Christian was relatively short, probably a little more than a decade, but it was eventful, it was productive, and it was exemplary. It's hard to imagine a better model for Episcopal leadership in difficult times. Decorum solemnitate Gauden tangeli Et collaudant filium de Way of the Fathers is just one of the podcasts produced by catholicculture.org. To hear more from the Church Fathers in their own words, check out Catholic Culture audiobooks, readings of Catholic classics, including the Fathers and St. John Henry Newman. You might also enjoy Criteria, the Catholic film podcast. It's a film club devoted to works of high artistic caliber and Catholic interest. And for interviews on a wide range of topics in Catholic arts and culture, listen to the Catholic Culture Podcast.